good morning and welcome to Scholarship. As many of you know, I'm Danuni Yatetsky, Dean of Libraries, and I'm pleased to welcome you to this special edition of Scholarship. First, I want to note that we are recording this session. As with earlier Scholarship discussions, we will post the recording on the library's YouTube channel. I ask everyone in the audience to please stay muted throughout the presentation, but we will have time at the end for questions and comments and hopefully our typical lively conversation. And I look forward to the food for thought discussion. So it's really rewarding to realize that this year marks the 10th, 10 years of scholarship. We started this event series back in March 2012 to help build a cross-disciplinary community of intellects at Drexel and to connect inquisitive dragons to scholarship. COVID-19 and moving to virtual events during the last two years has made that mission a bit more challenging. Zoom does not make it easy to facilitate the serendipitous conversations that uh, you have in physical spaces, but we have done our best to encourage conversation and discussion at the end of each event. I'm pleased to announce that as of now, we do plan to host the June 6th scholarship event in person at the study hotel, next door to Hagerty here, so stay tuned and we hope to see you there as well in a closer, real proximity. So as you may know, for our 10th anniversary, instead of hosting just the typical three events, we made the bold decision to host 10 food, food for Thought events running through the end of the spring term. This session marks four down and six more to come. So visit our events calendar for details about upcoming sessions. So today we not only continue our scholarship 10th anniversary celebration, but we also celebrate Autism Awareness Month by offering an opportunity to learn about one Drexel faculty member's contributions to autism awareness and research. And now I'm pleased to give a short introduction to today's thought provoking speaker, Lindsay Shea, Associate Professor of Health Management and Policy in the School of Public Health. Professor Shea is the leader of the Life Course Outcomes Research Program, which works to empower families, communities, and organizations to create a world where people on the autism spectrum are valued and supported as contributing members of the community. She's also the director of the Policy and Analytics Center at the AJ Drexel Autism Institute, where she works to utilize innovative analytic strategies to support the development of effective social and health policies across the US. Dr. Shea leads autism-focused projects at the local, state, federal, and international levels. She first authored the Pennsylvania Autism Census Report, and her research interests include creating and using an evidence base, informing, evaluating, and implementing social, social and health policies. Dr. Shea holds a doctoral degree in health policy from Drexel and a master's in social policy from the University of Pennsylvania. So now before I turn the Zoom controls over to Professor Shea, let us continue our scholarship tradition of raising a virtual toast. We can always find something to toast. So let us cheer the start rather than the end of the spring term. Here's to it being a good one and to come out finally a burst into bloom. So thank you again for joining us today, Lindsay. And the Zoom is over to you. The Zoom space is over to you. Thank you so much for that introduction. I'm excited to be here. I really appreciate uh, the note in the chat from Kathleen Turner about Public Health Week. Um, I am a, a doctor of public health. We are a public health autism institute. I uh, you know, believe in public health and this is a great time for us to be having a presentation where I hope to hit upon the highlights of how public health is helping to make a difference in the lives of individuals on the autism spectrum. So uh, before I begin, I will credit a few of my colleagues who have helped me uh, to have this very fine presentation for you today. Chisa Merriweather is a graphic designer who, who works on my team at the Policy and Analytics Center and makes all of our products just look so incredible. And so it would be uh, you know, absolutely important to acknowledge her contributions for, for what I'm about to show you. Uh, Caitlin Copper Miller and Anne Rue are also two of my colleagues who oversee our policy impact projects, which I'll be emphasizing today as I walk you through ways that we're thinking about opportunities for how research can hurry up and make a difference in the policy environment. For me, this is driven um, at least in part by my own personal journey with thinking about autism 
as most of you are probably aware, in the 1960s and the 1970s, prevalent studies that focused on autism in US and in Europe found that about two or four, depending on the estimate, children in 10,000 were diagnosed with autism or met criteria for an autism diagnosis. And as we see in the media headlines today, um, the work out of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is now identifying that one in 44 children um, will meet criteria for an autism diagnosis. And there's a lot of conversation about why. Um, why the increase, how the increase, what's going on? Is it in the air, in the water, in the genes, in the brains? What's, what's happening here? And that is all very important research. That's very important work. That's very important public health policy and practice that's needed. Um, my work, however, is focused on what will we do to support individuals at all ages, at all ends and in the middle of the autism spectrum today? And, and how can we make the systems that are struggling to think about how best can we provide supports and services to this group better? And for me, this came out of my first job out of college where I was working for a field leading neurodevelopmental pediatrician who was taking his shoes off and sitting in rooms with kids with autism and doing assessments all day long and working 20 hour days, uh, you know, uh, had an office with just stacks of paper, floor to ceiling, because those handwritten notes and every margin of every note mattered to him and thinking about clinical nuance. And so I'm watching, you know, clinicians work incredibly hard and I'm walking out into the waiting room where families are literally grabbing at your clothes to say, I just need five minutes with this clinician. I need a diagnosis. I need a note for a provider. I need, you know, families were absolutely desperate to try and figure out what is happening with my loved one. And so what stood in the middle? The problem was the system, right? So the problem was that doctors are being forced to do shorter and shorter visits with less time to see patients and do what they felt they needed to do in a quality way. And families were desperate. And so when you put it all together, our question in the policy and analytics center is how do we make things better now? How do we use innovative research methodology? How do we use analytic strategies that tap new and very large data sets to support effective social and health policy in our backyard, in our state, nationally, and we're doing work internationally as well. We are able to uh, work on this mission through a variety of funding sources. We've been fortunate to pivot our work across the Department of Defense, the National Institute of Mental Health, as well as the National Institute on Aging, funding from the state, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, the city of Philadelphia, the Eagles Autism Foundation. We also have funding from the International Society for Autism Research and Autism Speaks. So it's important as we think about how to tackle the work today, to do this in partnership. And the ways that we have learned and grown from these partnerships have been deeply meaningful. So being in partnership with city council here in Philadelphia and with the city Medicaid payer, Community Behavioral Health, our Philadelphia Department of Behavioral Health and Intellectual Disability Services has helped us to understand as the system is working to improve how our policymakers, decision makers, the people who are putting the money where the programs are, how are they thinking about what they need to do next and how can we be in the mix with them right now? So one of the most important ways that we think about this is through a research lens. And so doing the work in communities requires that we are generating new data, using data in new ways, and making sure that we're thinking about this from a public health approach. And that's what's unique, not only about the Policy and Analytics Center, but also about the AJ Drexel Autism Institute. Most autism centers around the US and even internationally have a very clinical focus and or are focused on children. And the AJ Drexel Autism Institute is among the only uh, areas where we're able to think about lifespan and life course approaches. And life course is equally important because it emphasizes 
the many areas of all of our lives. Where do you work? Where do you eat? Who do you hang out with? How do you think about worship in your life and religious involvement? All the areas that are really important above and beyond straightforward health outcomes. How do we think about multidimensionality? We have a few specific projects that we're working on today that have helped us to move, we hope, the needle forward most immediately. We work very intensively on Medicaid and Medicare, which are two of the primary social and health safety net programs to support autistic individuals across the lifespan. They're also two of the only insurance options that are available as we know that employment outcomes for autistic individuals are poor as they age through adolescence and into adulthood. And that limits their ability to gain access to, to private health insurance through an employer. We're also working on the impact of the COVID pandemic, both through direct data collection with individuals and families and through the use of claims data from systems like Medicaid and Medicare. We have a scholar, Wei Song, who is a researcher who is completing a postdoc at Temple, who will be joining Drexel, fortunately, in July, who has expertise in community participation. And this is a way that we need to think about how we support people in navigating their communities, whether that is a social aspect of community participation or literally just traveling around your community. We have been able to gain new insight about what autistic individuals report that they want and need. Transition age youth face particular barriers as they age into adulthood, including the end of the education system entitlement. And so how do we think about what people need as those services drop off? Is there a different portfolio of services and supports that people are needing as they age? And how should that availability of services and supports look for individuals? and for their families. We have funding from the National Institute on Aging to look at the connection between Alzheimer's and, uh, and autism spectrum disorder. We participated in a, an NIH-sponsored workshop just a few weeks ago. And one of my favorite things about doing this work is that we find ourselves in places where we're talking about Medicaid and Medicare, claims data, insurance data, and at the same time, we have presenters who are presenting fly brains and talking about studying Alzheimer's in, uh, in animal models. And there's such different approaches to the science, all of which are needed. Within the Medicaid system, there's tremendous state variation. All states handle their own Medicaid programs differently. And so tracking the development and implementation of programs like home and community-based service waivers is critical. We have emerging projects, including a policy brief that will be released by the International Society for Autism Research in May that are focused on autism in the criminal justice system and several of our initiatives, including the Philadelphia Autism Project and our statewide ASSERT collaborative have been doing groundwork on training first responders and partnering with police officers in the criminal justice system and the courts to help improve outcomes. We also focus on health systems and services. How do we improve how people feel and how we can make the experience of aging, the experiencing of aging from when you are three, the experiencing of aging from when you are 12, or the experience of when you are aging from when you are 60 better? Autism research has in particular faced several struggles. So we know that the prevalence has been increasing, which makes autism fairly new to the table. So there is a way that we are gaining specific insight as the prevalence is increased, where in comparison, other conditions for whom the system has been designed, such as intellectual disability, have had 50 years of understanding that individuals will live their whole life with autism. And much of that has been fueled by early public health campaigns to increase awareness of autism in young children, which is very important and should continue. However, when not countered with dual messaging about how autism looks in adolescents and adults and in late adulthood, we find that the community and public health needs to continue to improve in understanding that autism grows with you. And it is in most cases, and predominantly a lifelong condition. 
We also face an issue in research. And so primarily that issue is the lag between how long it takes research to move itself into policy and practice. We know this lag can be between 10 and 25 years, and we need to do better. I've found myself in several occasions sitting at uh, testimony, so city, um, city testimony or otherwise, and I'll be sitting next to uh, a parent or a caregiver who's talking about their experience getting their child diagnosed 30 or 40 years ago. And they say that they hear the same things from the families who are testifying that day about their young children who are today three and four years old. And that's a problem when even in these last few decades where we've seen such a tremendous uptick, almost $300 million in funding um, for autism research through specific NIH institutes, where we have not done better to help expedite getting that research into policy and into practice. And so we founded the Policy Impact Project with the priority being to help move this along more expediently and with quality. The Policy Impact Project is a co-venture of the Policy and Analytics Center and the Life Course Outcomes Research Program. And so the goal is to today seek to address the needs of autistic people and their families. Our mission is to use research findings to propel systems level change, thinking with that public health lens, to improve lives and facilitate the translation of research into policy. So the disconnect between autism research has several dimensions for us to think about. One in particular has been a loud call for us to do better on engaging diverse communities in autism research. Typically studies that are focused in uh, lab-based settings where they're looking at young children or, um, or even adolescents or adults are Part, are, include participants who can show up to a lab on a Tuesday at noon. And that is not the case for families who may be working several jobs, who may not have ready access to transportation, or who may have other barriers to participating. And so we need to figure out how to include the experiences of these groups more robustly. One of the ways that we tackle that is by examining systems in themselves. So when we look at claims from the Medicaid system, Medicaid is among the most diverse insurers in the nation. It insures more than 70 million people. We're able to look at how all groups are experiencing the Medicaid program. And so when we mix this research with primary data collection, we're exceptionally well poised to understand disparities, health disparities, and health inequities. There's also a need to move research so that policymakers can use it. Policymakers will not always, or will rarely, perhaps if ever, purchase a journal article, um, which is behind a paywall. And so how do we think about how to move the research into the hands of policymakers? How do we think about taking those 10, 25 page journal articles and making them into a digestible product, one or two pages that a policymaker will read, pay attention to, and that calls them to action for the systems over which they have purview? We also need some, we need to think about which policy levers are autism specific policy levers. Do we need new autism specific policy programs? Or is there a way that we need to think about more broad based public health improvements that help to also improve the lives of autistic people? So what are we doing in the Policy Impact Project? We are doing a lot of engagement, working with key partners, including policymakers, researchers, individuals, and families, working directly on the research that can help inform policy today, working to take our research findings and to put them into digestible information through collaboration, and also providing researchers with tools on how to get out there, how to get your information into the hands of people who can use it. You can reach our Policy Impact Project through the website. Um, there's a blog called Beyond the Abstract, which is growing and has exciting entries. We have an email, policyimpact at drexel.edu. And on Twitter, please follow the Policy Impact Project at uh, impact underscore policy.
The Policy Impact Project also puts together policy power lunches. And so the next one will be Wednesday, April 13th at noon, focused on avoiding ableism in research and policy. How do we move away from paternalistic approaches to policy and move toward policies that support people in where they want to be in communities and how they want to be? And that's it. I welcome discussion and thank you all for being here. Well, thank you so much for some um, really thought provoking food for thought here to start our conversation. So please feel free to either, we're a relatively small group, so either raise your hand or uh, type your comments in the chat if you in, in the chat if you'd like to stay anonymous and Stacy will read them uh, out loud or just simply unmute and share your reflections. So let's see how we can how we can best do that and um, perhaps we could drop the share so we can more see everybody i think we're almost on one page this time which is great all right so we can do that one screen at least on my screen i can get everybody so anybody would like to get started um i'll start um by asking could you possibly share a link to the beyond the impact blog that you mentioned mm -hmm. absolutely Awesome, thank you. Getting me there now. I was just interested in one of the specific kind of research approaches when you're talking about the aging, working with the aging and looking at the relationships of Alzheimer's to uh, autism. Does it go beyond that in other forms of dementia or is, it, uh, is the focus strictly on the disease, as I understand the difference of uh, Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, it, you know, there are a couple of different theories, and I'm not a clinician, and so much of this work is, is rooted in sort of clinical trajectory. Are there differences in um, brain structure, brain changes, perhaps even genetics, or other biological pathways that may provide a link between autism and Alzheimer's, and there is absolutely emerging dialogue focused on that. If NIH is focusing a workshop on it, uh, there's enough there <laughs> for us to be thinking about where it might go. Uh, for me, um, it, you know, I think the question is, there are, you know, the first people diagnosed with autism by Leo Connor, who is considered sort of the you know, father of, of autism, one of the first clinicians to really dub the term, we're diagnosed in the 40s, and so right now they are aging into their 80s. And you know, it begs the question: what has happened to this group? And what have they had to contend with? And how have they had to do so without programs to support their needs? And when we know that there are people um, aging, I think that means that we need to prepare the Medicaid system and the Medicare system to let these individuals gain entry into those insurance options, um, which is more challenging obviously for Medicaid than for Medicare. Uh, we also need to be sure that when they're in these programs that they have access to the services and supports that they need. Care coordination that helps you juggle between the health, behavioral health and mental health supports that, that help you to navigate the complexity of having multiple diagnoses. There are aspects of Alzheimer's that we've been able to identify in our research that may be particular, particularly important. We are observing that the, uh, there were some early theories that autism may in fact be protective of Alzheimer's and our research is contributing to uh, you know, rejection of that hypothesis and showing that autism, the autism group act, it does in fact have a higher prevalence of Alzheimer's um, than the general population. We've also found that Alzheimer's diagnoses and other dementia are occurring uh, earlier in life than among some other groups. And often our comparison group is intellectual disability because that is al also a group where disease onset is in childhood, typically lasts a lifespan. And we know there is in most cases a need for services and support. So we can put them on the same track and see when, do this, when does the diagnosis pop up? What services are they getting? What are their outcomes? And so um, a part of our challenge is that this data is incredibly complex to wrangle. 
So acquiring Medicaid data is a few hundred thousand dollars in and of itself. Medicare data is more expensive. Uh, gaining access to linking people uh, is uh, a complex regulatory process. And then you have to actually link the data itself and then figure out what to do with it. Because people who are getting this much care can have thousands or perhaps even more rows where we observe individual services. So it's a lot to unpack. Um, we have some hypotheses that programs that are perhaps attuned to things like Alzheimer's. So there are specific Medicaid programs that are focused on enrolling people with Alzheimer's and delivering care to that group, maybe primary targets for where we would be able to build in um, autism specific training or resources or uh, other programmatic supports for the group that presents with both diagnoses. We have a lot of work to do on that front. I, I think um, we, the Autism Institute also submitted a proposal for an Autism Center for Excellence. And one project in that portfolio is a project I'm leading that continues to focus on the experience of aging and autism. And I hope that that will be funded. Uh, and I hope that we will have an opportunity to engage in this work robustly. That's also a multidisciplinary team across several states. So I think that um, you need a lot of people at the table to tackle the big questions like this. And then link it to the policy change. What can we do today? Because there are people out there right now who need this change. They can't wait for us to have five years of an NIH uh, award to figure this out. What can we do now? Thank you. It is a complex portion of your work. Yeah. Thinking about it a lot these days, so I could probably go on and on in that area alone. And I think also, you know, that's an area where we have policymakers' attention. It's a group that's a high cost group. It's a group where uh, you have aging caregivers who have to think about what support they might offer. Um, and, it, you know, that means that we have to do a really good job of engaging policymakers from the get go in this work and not sitting back and doing this work uh, all alone and then expecting people to, to buy into it. We need to have those relationships all along the way. I have a question in chat, if I can read it, if nobody, that's okay, it looks like it is. Um, you mentioned a very important po point about policymakers not having access to articles behind paywalls. Do you have any thoughts on how you can help distill the research and distribute it to, to people so that they can use it? Um, I think libraries are probably interested in that. I know my ears perked up when you said it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I think open access is only going to get us so far. There's a lot of questions about who does open access? Why do they do it? How much does it cost? Um, and I think we need to continue to invest in that. I'm encouraged to see funders allocating resources to think about open access journal articles. Um, for, for me, and I think you know, for the Policy Impact Project, Twitter is an exceptionally powerful tool. There are a lot of policymakers and a lot of researchers who are on Twitter. And if there's a way to boil down, your Twitter forces you to take your research and get it into something concise, something um, meaningful that people can use. So, so there's a way that I hope that that experience among the academics who are you know, heavy in the Twitter use can get a little better at thinking about getting in an elevator with a policymaker and saying, hey, I have this great info. Here's what we can do to help shape policy to improve outcomes today. Um, so I, I think Twitter is one mechanism Policymakers are, are very typically, you know, married to the, the products that they're used to seeing. And those are one or two page briefs. And they want to sit in offices around big round tables and have conversations and hear stories and get to know people. And I, I understand how in academia, there's a tremendous amount of demand on our social capital for our projects, for writing grants, for getting things done. But I think that if we could figure out ways to take that extra step to form those relationships, they can be so tremendously rewarding and result in policy change more quickly. Um, that would really move us along. Um, for example, we have here in Pennsylvania, uh, Senator Bob Casey, who is a leader in the Senate around um, 
you know, disability issues, disability policy. And we have a close relationship with, with the folks on his team that has been completely formative in helping us to understand how the policy maker is thinking about what they need to do, how we can think about points of influence, points where our research may be prime to help impact um, their work. And that's only through one branch of government, right? There are other branches, so it's sort of, it becomes a big thing to think about, but the point of the policy impact project is to help usher that along and to be available to researchers to help consult and provide pathways for how you can get to the right policymakers at the right time to help move your research into, into the real world more quickly. Thank you. Does anyone else wanna put anything in chat? You can send it to me privately or post it publicly or like Danu said, just feel free to unmute and turn your cameras on. I'll just follow that up with one additional point if it's okay. Um, I think the other thing that we need to do better about in research is uh, data visualization. People love maps, people love like any, you know, taking our, those, you know, long form publications and sort of table after table after table and moving them into something that is exciting for people to look at, people can engage with, putting them even into um, usable interactive data programs like Tableau and other interfaces so that people can get in there and click around. I think would do a great service for not only moving research into policy, but also perhaps helping people to embrace navigating research themselves, thinking about navigating information um, as an effective data user too. I, I can't help but ask here then, um, how you see perhaps partnerships with the, both the, the, the management of your research output and the uh, not just in terms of preserving it for future um, people, but making those the whole the whole connections between finding collaborators or having people find your research as opposed to somehow pushing out and hope that somebody will notice it, um, as well as um, being able to contribute to it in ways that you're talking about because it's it's the public health approach you know to and, and other, other interdisciplinary uh, groups as well. Of how do you get research to the public? How do you get it to the people who perhaps most will benefit from its activities? But behind that, there is a need for some infrastructure to make sure that you, you can shift through what's, what's reliable, what's, what's valid information. How do you repackage it? How do you get to it? And of course, this is an area where libraries are trying to, and different information science uh, organizations and, NIH being among the leaders in this too, are, are trying to uh, figure out solutions. So it's sort of a, it's equally a sort of a wild, wild west <laughs> frontier right now. But as you're looking for projects, if that element of your um, efforts, uh, you might find partnership in the library's efforts to try to scale and do something that would help the university's assets of this output be more available and, and um, effective in the long run new research. So we got the gap. See if see if we can make visible our our researchers to then be found and influence future research. Absolutely. I think those are all important priorities. I you know I wonder if there are ways, you know, I think this is the next frontier for the policy impact project. And I think there could be also, you know, more substantive engagement with the library to think about um, how exactly we can partner on those endeavors. I think there's absolutely shared intent and, and mission there. I would look forward to that. Any other questions or comments or curiosities? It's probably not an area many of us are deeply aware of. So to me, this is quite interesting to just get us, uh, get us into the ground, get us into the reading. Danuta, you're trailing off a little bit again. Ah, sorry. Yes, this new laptop. I was just saying if there's anything else that um, might be a curiosity or comment from folks, this is perhaps not an area that many of us are uh, deeply aware of or involved in. I think it's a great way to try to get us thinking from what we're doing or our area of knowledge, how it might relate. 
Lindsay? I have a question. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Kathleen. Oh, Lindsay, that was a great talk. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, it, it, it just sort of caught my attention that you talked about um, that it seems in the aging process that rather than autism being protective against Alzheimer's disease, that there seems to be higher levels. I know there are other people at the Institute who are looking at, you know, potential contributing factors and, you know, wondering whether there might be something that is increasing the levels of both. Yeah, this is this is indeed an interesting area. And I think it's been fascinating to hear my clinical colleagues talk about, you know, brain development and how do we think about if a if an, a child on the autism spectrum has fewer opportunities to engage in education or with social relationships um, or perhaps, you know, other cognitive development, how does that impact decades later mm -hmm. their risk for dementia or for Alzheimer's? And I think, so there's the clinical lens that says, how is the brain changing? How are, how are the skills moving? And for me, the question is about, oh, well, that means that we need to start the policy process much earlier, right? right? That we right. need to be setting targets for in, in education engagement, social relationships, um, for all of those opportunities early in life and being sure that we are backing policy services and supports into those requirements and seeing it through. Um, all across the lifespan to help improve outcomes. And I think the real sort of powerhouse impact there is when we do both, right? Like when we have research that says, we're watching the brain do this, you know, um, and we have systems reform happening at the same time, we can make an impact for a generation, right? Sooner than it would have taken for our research only on that brain change component to move into systems and practice and public health. And so that's what we're trying to, to push along. It's funny. Um, there are a couple of different examples where we literally talk different, right? So like I've been um, in, in meetings where uh, I'll use a term from the policy world that is completely different in a clinical context. And so <laughs> it makes that question earlier, how do you write a Twitter post? How do you write a policy brief? with the right, like you may know what you want to say. You may even have a very strong research finding to point towards system reform, but how do you then find the words that yes. is going to resonate with a Senator Casey who's thinking about Medicaid reform every day versus, you know, some of our other uh, representatives across the political spectrum who are not remotely attuned to um, those policy nuances. And it almost becomes you need then you know, a hundred different policy briefs on the same issue, one for each Senator. And, and it's like, you know, man, this becomes unwieldy fast. And how do we get, how do we get to a place where we can, you know, use our, as we talked about a minute ago, infrastructure, our machinery to, to maximize the impact without doing that level of, uh, without doing that level of work. Cause that is certainly not sustainable. Um, so we have, a, we have a long road ahead of us. And I think the aging work is in particular, a place where there's a lot of energy right now. And I'm glad to see autism getting there. We have been, uh, you know, a, a sort of area of research and policy and programs very focused in children for a very long time. And it's time now for us to grow up <laughs> and, yeah. and get, get ready and support the community in, in all the ways that it's presenting. And, and that is not always in sort of a cute three-year-old, right? Who, uh, that there, this gets messy as people, um, as we all age, right? Things get complex and, and we have to be ready to bring policy approaches to the table uh, to, to meet that need and, and, and move it forward now. It feels very, very urgent to me. And the more I hear stories, I'll share one. Um, we had done some work uh, 
this was this was probably more than a decade ago when I was still at uh, Penn, we had done some work at a local state hospital. And so these are institution-based settings. And one of the people who we interviewed was a mother whose son had been diagnosed by Leo Connor at Hopkins in the, one of the, probably the first few hundred children ever diagnosed with autism. And uh, she shared the note from Leo Connor. And, and that note said, you know, he, that this child should be institutionalized or placed in a dog patch community where, you know, the diverse uh, range of his needs will be more thoroughly understood. And, um, you know, I think the problem for me is that when we look at our data, we still see clinically complex people who are put in um, more restrictive care than is needed today. It's 2022. It is time for us to do better than we did, you know, way back then. And the only way we're going to do do that is by communicating with each other and and pushing. Yeah, I think anybody my age <laughs> looks at it and says, you know, why are there so many children with autism? When I was growing up, there were no children with autism, and right. Well, no, there weren't. They were invisible because they were institutionalized. They weren't in our classrooms. They weren't mm -hmm. you know, around the neighborhood. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they were put into these institutionalized settings and just not part of the community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering with that, Kathleen, though, too, is is how, how much has the assessment ability, the ability to assess a person's um, state of autism or what needs they have has changed over our generations? Because you know, I agree with you, we didn't, I think it was partly awareness, as you're saying, awareness building, but perhaps two people were not thought of as being autistic. They weren't identified as stuff to, to need special care. It might have been just, they were troubled people, you know, they were, they were kids that were learning differently or something. Um, and I think now we have much more emphasis and sensitivity to the fact that um, we can understand what, what a person's needs are. And the diagnostic criteria have changed, yeah. right? Even mm -hmm. from that initial iteration of autism, we now have literally new ways that we count and characterize autism. So that's, that's one component. But I think, you know, we have over the decades experienced the institutionalization we have experienced new federal law lawsuits at the local, state, federal levels that have consistently um, been driving toward community-based care, care in the least restrictive setting possible. And, and that means, um, you know, ideally, I would love to see us move to a place where we're talking about optimizing care and not just trying to meet some bare minimum, but really trying to move toward what we all strive for for our own lives which is, you know, how do I feel the most comfortable? How do I do the things I want to do? How am I, um, how's my body feeling good? And, and that's, you know, even from an assessment tool perspective, in our work with Pennsylvania, which has two of the only adult autism Medicaid programs in the nation, they have the adult autism waiver and the adult community autism program. Both are for only 21 year olds and older. Um, you know, they do not have tools that they can use to help assess the needs of the people in these programs, more than a thousand people. And they have had to create these tools anew. And we've been so fortunate to be along for that ride, to learn from that ride, but to have to watch them juggle caring for people today and building the tools to think about the people coming along tomorrow has been frankly pretty disheartening that our research community hasn't done better by giving, giving those people what they need to, to care for people uh, better and more quickly. So, so that is our goal, to expedite, expedite, expedite um, those processes. I think, Catherine, you wanted to um, also make a comment earlier, not to lose sight. Yeah, sure, I have a question. Lindsay, are there any policies on the table right now, either at the local, state, or federal level that we should be supporting or keeping an eye out for that will help support your work? We are careful of our lobbying, anti-lobbying status um, here at Drexel University. So, uh, you know, our engagement is always sort of using the research to inform evidence-based 
policy. There are a couple of new things um, happening right now that are, are really very cool. So our partnership with Philadelphia with Community Behavioral Health, which is our city Medicaid payer, has yielded a new program that's focused on autism peer supports. So this is a, peer support is a mechanism, it's a service modality that has been utilized heavily in mental health and in veteran communities, whereby individuals experiencing a mental health diagnosis or veterans or both um, are paid through Medicaid to provide peer support to their counterparts living with those diagnoses and those experiences to help them work through and achieve the life outcomes that they identify. And so there were challenges to the idea of peer support and autism because um, of the social and communication components of the diagnosis. There were um, certainly, I think, certain sets of people who thought it would never work, that autistic people could not engage with autistic people to, to help them navigate their path. And we are finding um, quite the opposite. We are finding that peer support is an effective modality, that it is a way that autistic people can support each other, that the lived experience of being autistic and navigating the world and then supporting another person through that process is invaluable in thinking about how to, um, to support each other. And that supports an employment outcome for people because they're in a paid employment uh, opportunity through peer support. So, um, so the peer support component is very exciting. That's not a bill you can vote for, right? That's, that's like a program that's being built in Medicaid programs, which is again, a function of our different branches of government. I think there's gonna be a lot of attention to Medicaid. You're gonna start to see in the news as the COVID pandemic has brought a lot of people on to Medicaid through emergency mechanisms, through Medicaid expansions, et cetera, people are going to start to risk losing their Medicaid eligibility. And so I think anything that we can do to ensure that people have access to Medicaid when they need it as an insurance options prevents emergency-based care, prevents people from only going to the ER when they need something. It supports access to things like well child visits early in life, getting parents um, access to an insurance program where they can show up at a doctor. And at those well child visits, there are screenings for autism. So that's a way that we can think about early detection and diagnosis, which is another feature of the work that's happening at the Autism Institute. And um, access to Medicaid is really necessary as uh, young adolescents are transitioning into adulthood, education system goes away. We know that employment outcomes are poor and among the only insurance options available to these individuals is Medicaid. Medicaid also has these home and community-based waivers, which um, allow for a wide variety of supports, everything from community participation, employment, healthcare. Um, Medicaid is set up to be the system that takes care of people who don't have another insurance option. And so I think the one place that my own personal beliefs um, would propel us is in supporting Medicaid access. Wow, it's been a very engaging conversation. Our are there any other last uh, comments or questions, Lindsay? Giving us a lot here to think about and to keep in mind and watch out for. If not, let me ask us all to thank you very much, Lindsay, for sharing your time and your research and your insights and helping raise our awareness about a very important part of our, of our world, and our, our diverse populations of people we're working with and engaging with. So thank you. Thank you for having me. Like Congratulations on the series. What a tremendous opportunity for Drexel to um, be engaging. I, I really uh, look forward to the next one. Good. I think the next one's next week. <laughs> do you want to give a plug, Stacey? I can absolutely do that. The next one is on Thursday, the 14th, and it's with Professor Christine Unsworth. She's going to be talking about um, access to data and information justice and the ethics of uh, posting information online and things like that. So I can drop a link to the calendar page. Um, that one will be from four to five o'clock. So it'll be in the afternoon again, but I hope to see you all there. Thanks. Thanks.